Well, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at a conference about beauty and polymers with uh, complex architectures. But in fact, I'm going to talk about something um, a, a polymer that has correctly almost no architecture. And at times it has seemed like it had the wrong architecture. And I think we understand that now. Um, <clears throat> and I'll explain why we're interested in that. Um, but before I do all that, I want to mention that uh, maybe almost 40 years ago, uh, I spoke at a ACS Southwest Regional Meeting in Lubbock, and it was a wonderful thing. It's a great way to uh, begin to explore all the, the, the enormity and the verse and the, uh, the variability and versatility of chemistry. So I'm really appreciative to the organizers who do a pretty thankless job to do all this work. Okay, so the work I'm going to talk about is um, um, just like that previous meeting was, um, I'm coming back full circle, start over again. Important to get the first part right. Okay, so I'll begin with this slide on the screen, and begin my organization, my talk. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to a symposium on the beauty of polymers with complex architectures. Uh, but in fact, I'm going to talk about uh, polymers that uh, have almost no architecture and finally seem that way. In the past, they seemed uh, that they did strange things. I'll explain that. Uh, before I do that, I should thank the students and who did the work, um, especially Paul Balding and uh, the donors over the years. You know, a long time ago, almost 40 years ago, my first ACS meeting was the Southwest Regional Meeting. And it was in Lubbock, Texas, and I'll never forget it. Um, all sorts of new words were learned, all sorts of new concepts. Uh, the very idea of how meetings worked uh, was really great. And so in a way, I'm coming full circle. And this talk is kind of a full circle talk too, uh, because uh, we've been working at this for a long time. See all the other people down there that have been working on this perfect polyelectrolytes idea over a long time. It's always been sort of our second project, but it's a, it's, it's a fun one. And I'm going to explain to you why we got interested in it. And, you know, this started a long time ago in the days when you could study puzzles. Uh, now you're supposed to study problems. Uh, somehow science got associated with the uh, problem solving, and of course it's very good at that, but there is a science beyond that. There's just being interested in something, and I've seen some people who are adherents to that at this uh, talk too. Uh, very refreshing. Um, well, let's uh, look at this question. Let's look at uh, the hydrogen atoms, which the nuclei, strip off the electrons, and you say, do they attract or repel? And of course, Coulomb tells you uh, that they will uh, repel. Uh, but if there are electrons, then you can make hydrogen so they attract, right? Which is it? Repel or attract? Well, it depends on the electrons. It depends on the environment. Let's look at polyelectrolyte. This one contains high, two high charges. This could be as much as minus 1,000 on either one. And even though you have them swimming around in water with a high dielectric constant, at least at DC frequencies, it's high, um, you would think that they would repel each other. But there is an environment, many other counter ions. And that can bring them together. And for a long time, people have suspected that this really happens. Uh, so it's a, a point of curiosity. It bears on things like the origin of life, um, uh, interactions in all sorts of living systems. We now have very fancy phase diagnosis, uh, phase behavior, and sort of subphase behavior. It's really kind of a, a mess in polyelectrolytes, which is what um, Professor Schantz uh, said yesterday in his wonderful talk. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, well, uh, we're going to study that. You need some sort of model polymer. And uh, the most common one is sodium polystyrene sulfonate, which is usually made in this grotesque process involving chlorosulfonic acid or the really harsh methods. And uh, we always thought it could damage the polymers, but in fact, more likely, it, it, it leaves them sort of not fully sulfonated. And so groups that are not fully sulfonated, as again, Professor Schantz pointed out, sulfonate is really powerful, soluble. 
uh, and that's what carries this grotesquely hydrophobic thing into water in the first place. If 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 we miss a few, then what's to prevent them from coming together and forming this sort of like in, intermolecular or even intramolecular micelle like zone uh, that doesn't get properly solvated and affects the extension of the size of the pollen so back here. So if that happens, you might expect a, a, a more compact, denser type of pollen. Okay. So, uh, well, that's why we were interested in it. It's important that, uh, you know, in the, in the age of puzzle solving, you know, it's good enough. Uh, today, we need practical applications to motivate science, apparently, um, or at least to motivate funding. So uh, I will point out that uh, you can take naps sodium polystyrene sulfonate, not real naps after lunch. You can take them uh, to cure uh, chronic kidney disease or hyperkalemia, uh, just as or, you know, get your doctor to prescribe some for you. Uh, it's used as a water softener. You don't need that here in Baton Rouge, which has the very best water in the whole country. Um, uh, and it's also uh, little tiny amounts of, of naps are, is added to cement, and it has the most remarkable effect. Um, if you just Google super plasticizer on YouTube, you'll see some wonderful videos on that. Uh, and it really makes it flow. Uh, using less water, water equates to weakness in cement. So uh, you get higher strength cement uh, with uh, this uh, little bit of naps. And when I talk about a little bit, this is tons, right? Because we, we use lots. Of All right. So what are some of the characteristics of a practically perfect Poly electrolyte that we were looking for. Well, we wanted no hydrophobic patches. We wanted it to be fluorescently labeled, uh, which you know is doable. Uh, we wanted it to be uniform in size. We wanted a very broad range of molecular weights. We should have at least gram quantities available. And then there are those who say you want it to be never dry, freeze dry. Well, let's start with uh, impractical ways of doing this. And this is a theme that I came up with myself, so it can't be that good. And it was to add uh, vinyl aniline to sulfonate and make this copolymer. And I went to Bill Daly, the resident expert in polymer chemistry at LSU at that time. And uh, he said, no, that you won't get much in there. And I said, perfect. I don't want much in there. I want it just a little bit so I can lightly enable it, put a fluorescent dye on this and process that you see here. Uh, this has the advantage you're making it in water first place, you don't have to worry about it being dried out and forming right. Um, there's no catalyst, really, hardly any catalyst to, to, do, to doing this, just a little bit of AIBN. Um, and it works great. You can sort of control the molecular weight with the amount of water methanol ratio so that echo that in a minute here. Um, so we did that, and we compared uh, some other wise labeled materials to ones that we made uh, by GPC fractionation of that process. And we were able to get, you know, six fractions just by holding a test tube at, at the end of a GPC, you get six fractions in what a half hour, maybe an hour at the most. And we could do diffusion measurements using our fluorescent soda bleaching recovery apparatus. Uh, yesterday was mentioned a little bit about fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. For polymer studies, in my books, uh, fluorescent soda bleaching recovery beats fluorescence correlation spectroscopy six ways to Sunday, it's just there. Um, and so we can really pop off nice polymer physics -y type data like this. Look at the intercept of the slope there, minus 0 0.6, 3 fifths is what you'd expect for expanded random oil, okay? So we could do more of that since we have them labeled, we can mix them with stuff that isn't labeled and we can do diffusion of labeled stuff through matrices that are not labeled. We could do, um, it's open close experiments, expanding and contracting. And oh, by the way, all this was uh, part of a uh, project on Alzheimer's disease. We can do the same thing in early stages of, of aggregation of Alzheimer's and follow the same technique here. So you see that you can pretty quickly, uh, you know, see uh, polymers expanding and contracting uh, with these labeled polyelectrolytes that are practically perfect, they just don't have a lot of them. <laughs> All right, so to make them practically perfect, we would try to have more of them. And Trilatha Balamurgan, who's now at Albemarle, and Wayne Huberty, who used to be at Albemarle, now at Mississippi State, 
uh, worked on this process here, they said, well, rather than make the polymer and then label it, let's make a, a little bit of a FITC labeled vinyl aniline. And, and we actually don't know the right name for this. We just call it FITC addict, okay? So, so we take this addict and regular um, vinyl sulfonate, uh, styrene sulfonate, and copolymerize them, and we get this wonderful material. Uh, you get it in much larger quantities, uh, and um, it works if you start with the good news in green there. The PDIs are reasonable, um, as Professor Grayson showed this morning. <laughs> perfect is perfect is good enough. Uh, I don't know how to make this one perfect, but that's okay. Uh, the problem with this was that we were nowhere near our target. And uh, this is typical data it means that this is the these are the best results that we had here. Okay, so uh, there's something wrong with this synthesis. And about this time, um, I decided to move uh, to Georgia Tech. Um, I guess I'll uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, chromatography here. A little bit on that. Um, make a point. This is how chromatography looks of those materials. They look okay. Um, in fact, they don't look okay, okay? So, so we decided to put this into a, a kind of an obscure but really fun journal on, on journal of fluorescence. Um, and you can just Google that quickly from there. And we studied coffee rings with it. So it's a lot of polymer physics people are interested in the drying, how polymers dry, what kind of structure. You make when polymers dry. So about this time I moved to Georgia Tech and Chris Matichewski was visiting almost my first or second month there, I guess. And I got the assignment to take him to lunch, which was great, uh, except for the lunch itself. It's kind of a food desert. But anyway, um, uh, and I explained to him the problem we were having with this sort of poor control. And he, he literally grabs a salt shaker on the table and salts his food and say, you just need to add salt, okay? Uh, well, this is this is what he really meant here. Um, you could study all this ATRP aqueous ATRP script that he has written out. This is from his web page, and uh, you can see if you start over here on the right and you add salt. If you think about it long enough, um, good things will happen by adding salt. I don't remember. I don't recommend thinking about it that long. Uh, let's just look at whether it's right or not. Um, so. I got this student, wonderful student, Paul Balding, uh, and he decides to do more than just add salt. He varied everything that you see on that script. He just went in and rewrote, you know, so I tried it to everything you can think of. Uh, it's hundreds or at least more than a hundred uh, samples were made. All of them are measured in triplicate on GBC, so it's really quite a lot of work. Um, and I don't really want to emphasize too much about it, but the, the gist of it is uh, that he comes up with a method uh, where you can sort of leave the, cattle, uh, the monomer to initiate a ratio alone, just sort of pre prepare something, and uh, be careful about your uh, methanol water content, be careful about your pH, and you get very predictable results, okay? quite reproducible. Even the syntheses, were reproducible. So we, he, re, he did all the GPCs multiple times, starting from scratch to make new polymers multiple times. You still get reliable, reproducible results. It's a mirror. Okay, a little bit about what went into all that, just to compare it with commercial sodium polystyrene sulfonate. Um, this, uh, there's this little tiny peak here that finally disappears uh, in proton NMR. And the, Carbon-13 NMR has some details in it as well. Uh, you'll look also where there are little asterisks, uh, if you can see them. Uh, there are slight differences, the little features that go away when you get to uh, polystyrene sulfonate. And you can use uh, integration under the appropriate peaks to uh, calculate how much uh, material is not sulfonated. <laughs> and it's like up to 11%, sort of 6 to 11% of the material is not sulfonated in various commercial naps. And that includes the ones you use 
as standard reference materials in calibrating your GPC. All right, so at this point we have better sensors. Uh, we also have better chromatography, uh, courtesy of Rafael Cueto and his wisdom about chromatography. Uh, by the way, I'll mention that uh, we've also expanded now to asymmetric field flow fractionation rather than just GPC. Uh, I think G, uh, the latter asymmetric field, AF4, uh, beats GPC. I'm not going to go into that. Uh, you can talk to me about that if you want to. But I think the, uh, for aqueous systems, the days of GPC are numbered. Uh, but I've been saying that for a long time. It's a horrible technique if you think about it. I do want to point out that even when you uh, convert your data to what you really want out of a GPC, which is concentration versus mass, uh, the peaks look pretty good now, thanks to Raphael. Uh, they do look a little narrower for the uh, NA4 PSS. NA4 PSS is sodium 4 polystyrene sulfonate. That's the good stuff. And commercial is it's called CNAP. Uh, what about some physical chemical properties? Since I was trained as a physical chemist, I should do some of that. And you know, everything that we get in uh, polymer science, um, molecular weight gain comes uh, at after we measure DNDC. Unless you're doing analytical ultracentrifugation or MALDI or osmometry, God help you, uh, you're going to need a DNDC value. And you can see that it matters. Okay, So the, the good stuff is in red here, the bad stuff is in blue. It is a different structure. OK. Um, and we've checked that at different uh, molecular weights, and we checked it for all four colors. So it is always a uh, different structure between the commercial and the uh, good stuff. Uh, what about uh, polymer physics? Okay, this is uh, RG versus molecular weight from GPC. You can do this also in AF4 models, but I'm pretty sure this is GPC. And you see the typical Flory exponent. Uh, they always tell you in the flory degen theory that number is 3 fifths or 0.6. Uh, careful calculations show it to be about 0.588 by renormalization group type methods. Uh, we're getting really close. <laughs> Either way, we're pretty close with the good stuff. With the bad stuff, not so much. Now, the higher this new value, uh, the fluffier the material is. Okay? I could have shown you also the fractal dimension. That would be the inverse of the Flory exponent. And um, you can see that larger for the bad stuff. You expect that it's more contracted. Um, so you could uh, check that using partial specific volumes, V2 bar. This is what you'll need to convert from weight concentrations, like your grams per milliliter, to volume fractions. You need partial specific volume. And uh, again, it confirms that uh, the good stuff is a little fluffier than the well, I really can't tell you much about architecture um, of these materials. There is some SACS data waiting to be analyzed on them. But I can tell you a little bit about the hydrodynamic architecture, which is interesting for various theoretical people. And uh, you do that with this uh, ratio of radius of duration to hydrodynamic radius. So all of these uh, GPC runs, or many of the GPC runs, were also done with online dynamic light scattering. So we have the hydrodynamic radius. And you can see that the numbers are, you know, much, they're, they're certainly not like solid. It's kind of the numbers you expect for a polymer. But I don't want to get into the exact numbers because I think even the theorists are about what those should be. Uh, it's a pretty difficult calculation, I believe. Um, I will say that uh, if we had done this all by batch measurements rather than doing it online, you get a different answer, okay? Uh, so it's better to do it slice by slice in the GPC. And I say slices by slices because we get a RG value, I don't know, every second or something like that. But you have to run the autocorrelator a little bit of a long time uh, while the sample is running to get the RH value. All right, uh, what about physical properties, real physical properties? 
is there a glass transition in NAPS? This was actually suggested to us by somebody at the conference that that is a controversy, and indeed it is. Um, the answer is no. If you have pure material, there's no glass transition, period. It does not exist. Okay? So when you look at the commercial stuff, you see these little wiggles. There it goes. And you look at the good stuff. It's not there, not there on heating, not there on cooling. What about thermal stability? Commercial stuff. Kind of a, this is, these are derivative plots. That's an expanded area of this region here. Uh, and in commercial plots, uh, you see uh, much more action starting a little bit sooner, which we presume is the burning off of the unsubstituted styrene. Okay, so what about the future? What is in the future here? Uh, well, we will do more of this diffusion that I, uh, more of this stuff that I showed you earlier. There's a paper on it that's coming. Uh, diffusion of probes through pure probes that are labeled probes that are not labeled. Um, so this is, you know, kind of basic polymer physics -y information related to how the inside the cells work. Um, the question that originally started with these temporal aggregates, you know, these are the things that where the two poly electrolytes are drawn to each other by the, all the salt environment. If those exist, which I think they do, um, how long do they exist? And so we have a scheme to do that. A very little bit of data on that required at the very start of COVID. Um, that we're still trying to figure that out. There is nothing in this recipe that prevents you from making deuterated pure naps. Okay. And, uh, you know, um, the reason I chose this Mary Poppins slide is that once you get it practically perfect, maybe it's time for somebody else to come in and make it even better and do something else with it. So we have some collaborators up at Oak Ridge who are working on uh, using this technique to make deuterated naps. And I'll just lead you uh, to imagine some other things that you could do, but certainly you could imagine how this negatively charged polymer sits down on positively charged substrates. Use that neutron scattering to figure that out. You could, uh, Think about layer by layer for neutron optics and some other possible applications. Well, hit the end. Time for the take home message. Um, this material naps, it's the simplest thing. Everybody in the polymer physical chemistry and physics community grabbed it off the shelf if you could buy it. That sometimes uh, you really just have to go make it. And it's really sad in a way to think of what beautiful work has been done on this basically crap polymer that people have. For all these years. When you send that message into macromolecules for publication, you may expect a certain degree of pushback. And what we sold the editor on was, well, what if everything we knew about polystyrene had actually been determined on polystyrene co-polyvinyl alcohol with 6 to 10% substitution? Would that be a significant thing to go back and correct. And he said, yeah, I think that would be, <laughs> you know. In fairness, the effects of having these hydrophobic groups on the chain at 6 to 10% concentration is not as severe as you might expect because of the dielectric effect of water screening them. So people have gotten away. This problem has remained hidden for a long time. But Lord Almighty, it is now easy, thanks to Matuszewski and his co-workers and others, to develop this ATRP for regular people to go in there, into the lab, and make this stuff, in this procedure that Paul Balding discovered. And you never have to have that question asked again. Why would we be working with these impure materials anymore? It's time for fundamental research and maybe even some applied things to stop. So the summary of the two papers um, are here. Um, better physical chemistry, um, the correct Flory exponents, uh, no glass transition if you have pure materials. Uh, I didn't talk too much about the results of the synthesis, um, but if you work at low pH, you have good control. It's a pretty slow reaction. If you work at high pH, it's rapid, but it's not as good. Okay, It's not bad. This looks bad, but it's not terrible. It's just not as good as it. 
So that's it. Thank you.